so good afternoon everyone um, and welcome to this uh, webinar on uh, uh, improvement of um, Mediterranean food systems towards food waste valorization. Uh, this webinar has been organized within the framework of the EU Green Week. Uh, and uh, we have uh, several invited colleagues. And I wish to, uh, first to thank everyone to, for being here. And a special thanks, of course, for our speakers for this afternoon. Uh, Carola from FAO, uh, Abdeslam from UMP in Morocco, and Ana Cristina Aguilher Santos from the University of Evra. It's a great pleasure to have you here, a special, very special and warm thanks to Carola for uh, in such a short no notice being able to, to join us today and to share her experience with us today. Uh, this webinar is organized also within the, the framework of our um, FOSAMED project, the project on enhancing food safety in the Mediterranean, Mediterranean who has been, uh, that has been financed by the EU. It's an Erasmus Plus program between uh, the University of Evra, the University of Barcelona, UNIMED in Rome, and uh, four Moroccan universities, namely uh, University Mohamed Premier from Ujda, or from uh, our colleague Abdeslam, but also IAV from Rabat, the University of Ibn Tofail in Kenitra, and the, uh, the Ecole Nationale d'Agriculture de Meknes. Uh, I see here that we have qu uh, quite a, a different list of participants. Uh, I have a, a slight change to the program. Since Carola has to leave after her presentation, I ask you to either raise your hand to do your questions directly to Carola after presentation or put them in the chat so that I can uh, do them. But we will have the question just after everyone's presentation and not uh, last as it was announced in the program. So without any uh, further delays, because you are here to hear our speakers and not me, uh, I would like to welcome uh, Carola Fabi. She's a senior statistician at the Statistics Division at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. And she's here uh, this afternoon to talk about the food loss and waste database of FAO, building ev evidence with artificial uh, intelligence. I thank you once again, Carola, and the floor is all yours. Yes, thank you very much, Marta. Good afternoon to everyone. It's a great pleasure uh, to be in this uh, webinar. Um, um, <laughs> Like Marta said, I'm a senior statistician with FAO for a long time. I am also the responsible officer for one of the sustainable development goal indicators, uh, the Food Loss Index. FAO is the custodian agency for the Food Loss Index, monitoring losses along the supply chain. And uh, we develop the methodology. And as you will know, I mean, food loss and waste is one of those uh, very important areas of work on the international development agenda where data scarcity is one of the main characteristics. There is very little data around and uh, not of the best quality necessarily. And so uh, what I am going to illustrate is an effort made by FAO to try and consolidate the available knowledge and make it available to, uh, to the community. Uh, so to create a public good around available data, available information on food loss and waste. So I will start uh, by sharing my screen, of course, now the, uh, okay. So, uh, sorry, it always takes one second longer than I would like. Uh, again, okay, here it is. Oh, this is the last slide. So, uh, very briefly, I mean, you all know, I suppose, uh, you are all familiar uh, with uh, uh, the Sustainable 
development goal target 12.3 on food losses, uh, uh, urging uh, the world and countries by 2030 to have per capita global food waste uh, at the retail and consumer level and reduce food losses along the production and supply chains include post-harvest losses. As you know, as you can see from the target, in fact, uh, this target differentiates the supply side and the demand side uh, of the food chain. And FAO has been mandated with a supply side, so tracking food losses uh, along, uh, so to reduce, uh, so uh, building an indicator uh, that can monitor food losses, can measure and monitor food losses along the production and, su and supply chain, including post harvest losses. Tracking food waste is under the custodianship and responsibility of the United Nations uh, uh, environmental, uh, environmental Programme. So to track food losses, what we did was to develop a whole, first of all, an indicator and a whole methodology around it with uh, uh, guidelines for data collection, a method for uh, the aggregation, and given uh, the, the overall data scarcity, a food loss estimation model to estimate losses by product and country for all the uh, for all the countries uh, around the world. Uh, however, since uh, official data, so nationally generated and reliable food loss statistics are extremely scarce, and uh, I understand uh, that you are uh, researchers, etc., so you can really appreciate uh, this piece of information. Consider that only 7% of the lost data uh, that is necessary to, to compile uh, the food balance sheet has been officially reported by the countries. This means that FAO is estimating the remaining 93% of data point with this food loss model uh, that I have just mentioned uh, before. So this is really the, 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 the one figure that summarizes, uh, that illustrates the extent of data scarcity when it comes to, to food losses. And these estimations are done based on a statistical model uh, using data from uh, academic, not uh, the, 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 all the officially available data, but also we tried and find data from uh, available journals, uh, reports. So a number of other data sources uh, that are not considered national statistics, uh, official national statistics. And uh, the database that we have developed tries and compensate uh, this scarcity of data. What you see here is are uh, the results uh, from, uh, from the model. You may have heard of the State of Food and Agriculture report of 2019 that was uh, focusing on food loss and waste where approximately 14% of the food produced does not reach the retail stage. We have updated these estimates to the year 2020. And losses after harvest and before the retail stage at global level are equal to 13.3%, with a certain distribution and some variability across the regions of the world. Uh, of course, the uh, Mediterranean countries are not uh, an SDG region, uh, so you will not find them here. Mediterranean countries are partly included in Europe as Southern Europe, partly included in uh, Western Asia and North, uh, actually North Africa and Western Asia are more representative of the Mediterranean countries and losses are higher and uh, slightly higher than the world, uh, than the world average. But as you will know, I mean, and as you know, these data are too aggregated to be relevant for decision-making. They give, uh, a sense of the extent of the problem at global level or at regional level, they certainly are not enough. So a big effort is needed uh, to build the evidence for uh, designing policies, taking action, decide on uh, investments and so on. So what we did was to build a food loss and waste database. Uh, so it's the largest online collection that you find right now. And it's especially valuable because we keep updating it. Uh, there are other databases that you will find online, but uh, after a first big effort of putting them on the web, they have not been updated. Others are very detailed, but only for a few value chains. Uh, this is the database where you can really go across countries, commodities, and stage of the value chain in the world, and that keeps uh, being updated every month. 
so uh, it's uh, yeah, like I said, it's a living data set. Currently, it has data from over 700, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, 700 publications and reports. Uh, there are over 32,000 data points, so loss percentages along the supply chain by country and commodity and stage. Uh, of course, these data come mostly from the officially reported data. I mean, the paradox is that there is very little available data, and yet the officially reported data are still the vast majority of what you find around. Uh, that also comes from the AFIS. It's um, uh, a database for post-harvest losses in Africa that has been developed with European funds. Uh, quite a lot of data points come from the United, Na United States Department of Agriculture and then in descending order, scientific journals, publications from other international organizations and so on. So what you have here is a screenshot of the homepage. And in fact, uh, underneath the first screenshot, what the database offers, which is what you see here in the left panel, is really, a series of filters where you can select uh, the geographical area of interest. It can be a region or a country. Uh, the products of interest, it can be all the products, a certain food groups or some products inside that food group. The stage of the value chain, all of them or just one of them or some of them. And the data collection method. What you see here. Uh, this is the first plot that you see in the home page, and these are all the available data points in the database by year, and the various colors uh, tell you what is the data source. Uh, the database has got four tabs that you will be able to browse. So first are the percentage points with uh, the filter. You will have a heat map of available data that gives you a GIST uh, of uh, uh, where, uh, what do the, the available data cover and what combinations of countries and products are absolutely not available. A box plot by stage to summarize the statistics and then you can download the data in the table. By the way, uh, in, the, in the data table, we also include a link to the article or the, the, the online source uh, from which we extracted the data. All the data that you see here is in the public domain, meaning that you can reuse it uh, as you need. So what you see here, for example, is a box plot by stage. We have represented uh, the Mediterranean countries. So we have extracted all the available data for the, for the available Mediterranean countries, all the products, all stages of the value chain. And you can see the extent and variability of food losses. So the level and variability of food losses in percentage of production for the various stages of the supply chain. And uh, of course, uh, needless to say, for example, transport losses can be very variable, uh, depending on whether we're talking about cereal transport, where losses can be very low, or fruits and vegetables, where transport is a critical loss point, as you will know. Processing losses are quite low. And also, you can understand from the shape of this box that there is little data available. Uh, processing is more difficult to capture because of respondents' rates, and at the same time, uh, it is also less variable. I mean, these are standardized uh, processing methods. Where you have a great variability is on losses along the whole supply chain. These are the officially reported data uh, that cover the whole supply chain that countries uh, provide to FAO for the food balance sheet. And uh, so, this kind of information is the one that might help you uh, identify the, the hotspot, for example, uh, where most stages occur. You can compare losses across the, the stages. Uh, you can read the box plot. It also tells you a lot about, about the variability. And so this is uh, the analytical tool of the, of the database. The heat map that I mentioned, for example, and again, here we are representing the, the heat map of available data of the Mediterranean countries. First of all, you will see that these are not all the Mediterranean countries. Huh? So some countries uh, did not provide to FAO or did not publish any study or were not covered by any study on food losses. Uh, and uh, you will find at the bottom the food groups. 
cereals and pulses, fruits and vegetables, animal products, uh, roots and tu bu uh, roots, tubers, and all bearing crops. And where you see a white, it means that there is no data. So, for example, Portugal, for the moment, did not provide any data officially to FAO. And we couldn't find a study on food losses about Portugal or Spain, for that matter. Huh? There is some data about cereal, uh, about Syria for cereals and pulses. There is quite a lot of data on Egypt for root tubers and oil bearing crop. Uh, where you have a color, it means that there are some figures. And uh, the lighter the color, the more towards the, the yellow color, the more data you have. So again, when, it, when we zoom into the Mediterranean, you see how scarce uh, the data is and the enormous scope that there is for improvement and the enormous need for data collection. For new data collection. Now, how did we use artificial intelligence? Uh, it's, it's in the title. So what did, what did we do? Actually, uh, starting this database uh, took one year and a half of uh, an intern who spent the whole time reading articles and searching for articles. And it's tremendously time consuming. And at the same time, there is also a high degree of arbitrariness. So we quickly realized that we had to automatize uh, some of the passages. So we have developed a whole application uh, that uh, goes from the so-called unstructured data. So here we're talking about documents that contain numbers in whatever form to a structured data set. So a table where you can read the rows and the columns, which product, which country, which stage of the value chain, which date, what figure, what data collection method, what is the reference source. So to do that, first of all, we developed some uh, uh, scripts to scrape the web. So uh, there are APIs, but not only uh, to go into uh, some uh, libraries, websites, and uh, other international organization websites and find the new articles and new publications about food losses. The second step is an automatic assessment of the documents to decide if they are relevant or not. And imagine that we have scraped several thousands of documents. In the end, fewer than uh, less than 30% uh, are relevant. And uh, so that helps saving a lot of time in reading a document that in the end does not contain any relevant information. Then there is a preliminary assessment of the available document to start processing and analyzing those uh, that are the most, among the relevant ones that contain the most relevant information. And then again, there is a guided uh, a guided tool to extract the data and the information from the text in order to make it quicker and to reduce the amount, the amount of manual mistakes. Then we have a manual data validation process and a process to upload the validated data into the database that you find online. So for example, when it comes to the automatic assessments of the documents, we started with this data set that the intern had put together, 300 documents. And we developed some statistical models uh, and decided and selected the one that was giving the highest accuracy. So we selected the model that was capable of understanding based on the 300 documents we had available, of understanding which documents were relevant and which documents are not. And so now we can update the database by doing the manual extraction, running the model and automatically discarding more than 70% of the articles that we scrape and just keep those that have uh, that are relevant uh, that are statistically relevant so that have a potential for producing new data. Uh, the second part is the preliminary assessment where we put uh, all the articles in a database that can be filtered uh, by uh, again uh, key we, one can look for keywords uh, uh, can be filtered by language review status the publishing year so that we can try and update first the database with the most recent data and then go back in time and so on. And that helps the analyst deciding which document to work first on and which ones to process later, huh? if time allows. Uh, then there is the second uh, uh, part where, again, artificial intelligence comes into the picture. Basically, the machine reads the documents and highlights those words that can be relevant, oops, sorry, 
for filling in the form. So this that you see here is a form where you have all the fields of the database. And here we have a guided selection of the country, the crop, the loss percentage. Uh, is it qualitative or quantitative loss? What is the data collection uh, method? What is the data source? What stage of the supply chain? And finally, the note. And so uh, by using this tool, one fills in the data table row by row in a faster way and minimizing uh, the typing errors and also the, the, the really the, the, the data compilation errors. Huh? So minimizing the human error, if I may put it like this. Uh, for the manual validation, uh, we have, okay, there are some uh, checks uh, in, the, in the database. And finally, we have developed also um, a shiny app uh, that looks at the data, compares data, and finds the outlier. And the final stage is when we have a data table. What you see here is, an or I mean, it looks like a database. So we have turned 700 documents into a structured table. And so the newly validated records, the validated data, gets uploaded in the food loss and waste database. I'm afraid the fields are very small. Uh, this is the problem with these uh, new applications is that there are a lot of white spaces and then the, 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 the characters are very small. But uh, I thought it was interesting for you to, to see how it looks like. And at the same time, time did not allow to have um, a, live, uh, a live demo. So as a summary for the Mediterranean countries, in fact, in this database that has <laughs> 32,000 data points, only 462 data points cover the Mediterranean countries. And of these, more or less 80% are officially reported to FAO. So only 20% of the data come from the literature review. This means that in the end, uh, the Mediterranean is still uh, not very covered uh, by studies or that these studies are not easily accessible. So we couldn't find them with our APIs and our crawler, our scraping. The data cover 13 countries and you have the list, 31 value chains, so 31 products covering the four food groups, but most of the data, again, is available for cereals and poultry. And so in the end, this is really, the, the, the conclusion is really that data scarcity is uh, uh, still uh, there, is overwhelming, and it is especially characteristic of the Mediterranean countries and uh, this uh, Southern Europe, North Africa and uh, Western uh, Asia region. And uh, with this, I stop the presentation and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Carola, for a very a nice and clear presentation for giving us the picture specifically for the Mediterranean countries um, and for keeping time also. And uh, now the floor is open for questions. I actually have uh, a few questions myself, if I may, may start while we wait for people to raise their hands. Um, you, you mentioned that the, the picture here in the Mediterranean countries is even worse than the general picture around the world uh, regarding the, the, um, the scarcity of data. Uh, so we, we are researchers, we are scientists, most of us here. How, how, how can we contribute to and the, actually two questions. How can we as researchers contribute? And uh, how are, the, it's a, a curiosity, how are these official data collected? For example, in Portugal, who would be responsible for collecting data and sending the data to FAO? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, both very nice questions. So the first one, okay, very concretely, if you have some studies on any Mediterranean country about food losses, yeah, whether uh, a pilot survey, a value chain analysis, um, uh, a field experiment, uh, testing, uh, harvesting practices, agricultural practices, uh, insecticides, uh, storage facilities, um, please send it to, to me, actually. I mean, I would say to us, but anyway, send it to me. We will be very happy to process it and to put it in the database. First of all, we will make it available to all the users. And second, 
this information will go in the estimation model next year. We run the estimates annually. This means that our estimates for the Mediterranean countries that are grouped by SDG region, uh, so you have seen uh, that the European countries go with Europe and then North Africa and uh, West Asia uh, make a group of their own. Um, it will help improving the estimates, which means uh, that uh, the also the users, uh, the decision makers uh, that look at uh, the SDG monitoring will uh, be better informed about the situation. Another thing is that as uh, the data will increase, we will be able to disseminate the estimates not only by region, but possibly progressively also by country. Uh, so that's, uh, that's one thing. Uh, the second is how do we collect uh, the official data? And actually here, of course, I skipped a huge chunk. Uh, in fact, uh, the, for the moment, the uh, only available estimate uh, food loss estimates at the national level that countries produce are for the supply utilization accounts food balance sheets. Uh, so where you have total food supply, whether it comes from production or imports or from opening stocks, and total utilization of those products, whether for uh, non-food processing, exports, uh, back to seed, for animal feed, uh, for, 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 or for food. And uh, so the, the, the supply utilization accounts food balance sheets are used to estimate food supply. So given uh, total supply, given all the utilization, how much is available for food by product in every country. And losses are one of the utilization. So uh, FAO has an annual uh, questionnaire that we send officially to the countries. And by the countries, we mean the statistics offices or the ministries of agriculture exceptionally some other line ministry. Uh, and uh, they reply with official production data, uh, official data on the utilizations, or some validated estimates of the utilizations, such as industrial use or, uh, or uh, use for feed, uh, availability for uh, human food consumption, and hopefully eventually uh, losses. So what we mean by the officially reported losses are those that the countries, the ministries, or the statistics offices provide to FAO through an official questionnaire that we send annually, where they inform us on a number of statistical variables, starting with agricultural production and area, but also the utilizations in food losses. Uh, okay, I hope that I... I can elaborate further. Yes, but, uh... <laughs> no. Regarding specifically regarding this, this means that for Portugal, no one answered the questionnaire, for example. No, no. or actually, the, 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 sorry, it's not true. Of course, Portugal does answer to the, quest, to the questionnaire, but uh, by reporting other variables. So agricultural area, production and yield, uh, maybe some utilizations like for feed or for seed or for industrial purposes, uh, but not the, part, but no information on losses, okay. not efficient, yeah. Okay, thank you. And as researchers, uh, when you say you can send it to you, for example, if we have a report from a, part, a project, even if it's not already published in a, a journal, we can send us information? Okay, that, uh, yeah, of course, that's a little bit more delicate. Uh, there are some, uh, um, we use some, we also use some data that we don't publish because of course we cannot put in our database something that the author would not want to see outside before it be published. So, uh, like I said, we have a filter. Huh? Some of the, yeah. some of our sources are not uh, in the public domain. They get processed uh, and averaged, et cetera, in the model. Uh, but of course, with the word of, uh, you should be aware of that. And you also need to warn us very clearly in saying, uh, this is our report, mind, it hasn't been peer reviewed yet. It hasn't been published yet. You don't have the accurate reference, et cetera. Let's say that, we, of course, we prefer to have, uh, uh, especially when it comes to scientific journals, to have 
uh, articles that have been published. Uh, one of our sources is academic sources. So if it is a PhD thesis, uh, you know, an internal workshop, etc., we can classify it as academic source. But you need to uh, you need to to agree or very openly disagree to the fact that that figure, that number, goes into the database uh, to give us guidance on how we how we can treat it. Okay, thank you very much, Carola. Actually, we have uh, another question in the chat. Alberto, yeah. do you want to put up your question directly? Uh, okay, yes, the, the 2020 baseline required by the European Commission will bring something. Of course, we can't wait for it <laughs> to, to be published. Uh, it's true. So, the, I mean, as you know, the European Union uh, produced a directive on uh, the measurement of food waste. By the way, we have also these discrepancies in the terminology. So, the European only talks of food waste, even if it is at the farm level where the SDG speaks about losses. Uh, so one has to know that food waste for the European Union includes losses. And uh, the directive gives guidance on the measurement and there is now a, commit, uh, a commitment by the member countries, the member states uh, to produce the baseline uh, for, uh, the, for this year in June actually. Uh, actually, so it's, it's coming, no, it's coming. No, they should be producing the baseline. Um, of course, that will change a lot the picture uh, because we will have 27 estimates in one go. Uh, it will require a bit of work because uh, the European framework, the conceptual framework is not 100% aligned with the SDG indicators, especially the European uh, Union looks at distribution and doesn't make immediately a distinction between the retail level and uh, uh, the wholesale level. So the countries will need to be able to split or in, with some analytical uh, methods to assign uh, losses at the wholesale level separately from losses at the retail level. Uh, so that is one of the, I mean, that is, let's say the, the, the main difference. The other thing is that in the end, the European countries uh, have put a very strong emphasis on waste, waste at the household level, waste at the retail level, because that's where it happens in the rich, I mean, in the high income industrialized countries. And so uh, the, the biggest measurements have taken place there, meaning that they are covered by the food waste index, uh, the other indicator that monitors uh, SDG target 12.3. Um, the next step is that they will focus on losses at the farm level, because the two extremes of the food chain are where losses occur. The intermediate uh, actors, uh, they optimize, but the farmers can face a bottleneck. And of course, uh, the consumer is where it ends. And so it might get spoiled, uh, food might get, get spoiled sooner or later. Huh? So, uh, but for sure the baseline uh, numbers are going to change uh, the, the, the picture and uh, the heat map. For example, uh, they're going to change the heat map. Hopefully, uh, next year we will have more countries, and uh, uh, with some data available on all the food groups. Thank you very much, Carola Alberto. I think Carola answered your question. I asked the other colleagues here: Do you have uh, further questions to Carola because she has to leave and will not stay until the end? Am I right, Carola? Yes, I will. Uh, I mean, I will stay until uh, four thirty, and then I will have to. Uh, I will have okay, to. so maybe if there's an additional question, either say it now or put it in the chat if you remember it later, or send it to us, and we'll forward it to Carola. I think she will available. She'll be available later to answer our questions. Carola, I thank you very, very much once again for accepting our uh, challenge to be here today and for a very, very clear presentation and a clear picture on what we have ahead of us. And we still have a lot to work together to contribute towards the, a better uh, SDG indicator uh, on food loss and food waste. So thank, thank you very thank you very much. And thank you very much Marta for uh, inviting me and uh, thank you everybody for your attention. Thank you.
So now uh, we proceed with the program and our next speaker will be my dear colleague Abdeslam from the University Mohamed I uh, in Morocco. And uh, Abdeslam will talk to us about table olive processing technology, improving quality and protecting the environment. Abdeslam, I hope you're ready. The floor is yours. Yes, share. yes. thank you. Thank you, Marta, for, uh, for organizing this important meeting and also for inviting me for your, your invitation and uh, for everybody who are sharing with us, particularly Carola, who, who shared with us uh, this important uh, subject, which is food, food loss and food waste, what we are uh, losing many, it means we lose a lot of effort when we lose uh, food. So today I will uh, speak about a, a subject on which I am working in my lab with uh, my, well, let me share my screen. Good, you can see very well. Okay. So, Today, I will speak about uh, table olive processing technology. Yes, it means because we will speak uh, particularly about a technological aspect related to quality and the protection of the environment. Uh, as, uh, as everybody knows that uh, Mediterranean diet was uh, inscribed from uh, 20, 2030 uh, as a uh, as an important uh, represent in the representative list of intangible cultural heritage as a, a manner of uh, living, of eating, and uh, uh, which is good for health because it gives an uh, important aspect in protecting health of consumer. And particularly by its uh, pyramid diet, Mediterranean diet pyramid, which is uh, when we look on this pyramid diet, we can see that olive products as are the cornerstone, we can be, can be considered as the cornerstone of, uh, of this pyramid diet, particularly olives and olive oil, which are uh, recommended to be used uh, every day uh, in our uh, consumption. But uh, yes, uh, every day, but uh, you can use it uh, in different forms like uh, olive table olives or olive oil. And in some, some cases we can use also olive leaves that we, which are now uh, lost as a, uh, as a byproduct or as, a, yes, yes, it contains many important molecules which are interesting for health, for many, many diseases which are, which are uh, covered or uh, treated traditionally with olive leaves. All these important uh, benefits are due to the monounsaturated fatty acid, but also to polyphenols, which are uh, very important uh, in this kind of, of products, particularly olives. But uh, this, these polyphenols are uh, considered as uh, a bad uh, molecule, by by people now, which we, which consider them as bit because of their bitterness, uh, the fruits are not uh, consumed directly because of their, these bitter tastes, which is principally due caused by this this polyphenol. That's why uh, people now are uh, de developed many processes. Particularly, we will discuss about only about two: the modern one and the traditional one. The modern one is mainly based on, uh, after harvesting and sorting, mainly based on a chemical treatment of olives, of fruits. So the fruits are treated with uh, sodium hydroxide uh, directly. Uh, and after washing, they, they are fer allowed to ferment in brine, in another chemical product, which is sodium chloride. Uh, and all these, these two products are I will not say that are only bad for heat, but also for environment, since uh, we will consume a lot of water. Here uh, you can see an estimation of uh, water, con of cons water consumed by 
uh, one ton of olives, it, may, it will need about a total of 1.5 ton of water. Uh, it means uh, olives are a big consumer of water. And after that, they, they release a lot of waste water, which are rich of, of sodium hydroxide and also of sodium chloride. It means of toxic compound, which are, uh, it's are not good for environment. And in addition, the fermentation is, uh, is conducted uh, around uh, two to three months to, to product a fermented olive, which is uh, which have uh, some good uh, attributes for, for consumer, particularly low bitterness, because people now are more and more uh, consuming uh, fruits or products which are sweet. So they are uh, losing or they are uh, leaving uh, the better go tests which are interesting for health. And also for their gold color, it was it was uh, uh, golden yellow color, which is nice to see, uh, not not like the traditional one. And also the another uh, strengthen of this process, it is the quickly it's a quick process. It uh, it means during two mostly two two months because it depends on the on the temperature, the ambient temperature. Two to three months, we can obtain a fermented product which is ready to, to be released in the market. But however, there are some, uh, some aspects which are not good uh, to have to say, yes. For consumer, for example, the, the, the chemical treatment leads to a loss of nutrients. Yes, a heavy loss of nutrients which are interesting for human beings, for, for health, and also uh, for high salt content, because here, since we, the olives are debitated, it means the, the polyphenols are, are eliminated. So we have to use high content of salt, of sodium chloride. It's around 10 to 12 percent. These chemicals are not, uh, not, not, it means their daily consumption leads to problem with the corona, with the, uh, it means, um, uh, diseases of uh, chronic diseases, yes, pressure, blood pressure, or or uh, cholesterol. In addition, all these these chemicals are released as wastewater, toxic wastewater in environment. This is an important. Uh, for uh, for instance, here in Morocco, the, there is a, a law which is uh, which imposed uh, for uh, companies are producing table olives to to keep or to the to, to, to develop a big basin or to trace their waste water it's forbidden to release waste water their waste water in environment but it was a big problem for these companies because there is no uh, efficient treatment or, which can uh, eliminate or treat uh, waste water with, with uh, high content of uh, sodium chloride and uh, sodium hydroxide. In addition, there is another uh, problem with the, this, uh, this for company because when you use sodium hydroxide, it means we are, uh, we, as you know, when we mix sodium hydroxide with water, it gives an exothermal reaction. It is a chemical reaction. So when it is not well controlled, it leads to spoilage. Uh, soft a loss, as uh, Dr. Carola said, uh, there is a lot of loss, which we of food loss, which we, we, we which is obtained during processing. One of them is here with olives, uh, which is uh, which can be estimated to, to 10, 10 to fifteen percent. Uh, it depends on the level of control of the process. It means the the person which is uh, who is uh, operating the, the process uh, should have uh, an, an important level of control of this process, scientific level to control the process, to avoid uh, losses, worst losses. Uh, but there is another, another process, which is a traditional one, uh, which people leave, left, um, left because of uh, 
uh, as we said, because of the color, because of, uh, of the end product, and also for the taste, where you don't, uh, people are living the bitter taste, where even if it is good for health, but uh, it's very interesting to, to try. So we studied, with, with, we, we chose to study on this process to develop or to optimize, to improve this process, which is associated, as you can see here, at, with a low water, con, water, con, water consumption and also with waste water released. Here, we, with one ton of olive, we need only uh, almost, almost one ton of water. Uh, it's a little bit uh, lower than what we, we can see in the other, in uh, the, the modern or the industrial process. So we chose to work on this, uh, this process by uh, to, to improve it, to avoid uh, the, to improve these transients like the nutritional value, which is important because it is rich of antioxidant and all with low salt content because here they, we use, uh, traditionally the uh, people use uh, only 5%, around 5% of salt, of sodium chloride, and the uh, low amount of toxic waste water because there is no chemicals, uh, no sodium hydroxide with uh, a lot of water, and it's easy to, to, to develop or to, to conduct. However, there are some other problems to, to solve or to, to improve, like uh, bitterness, uh, the problem of bitterness, and also for, of uh, spoilage, like uh, in color, particularly the color, because people, they see before eating. So that's why we have to work on this aspect to, to attract people or consumer for their uh, for the consumption of pro the product. In addition, the waste water is rich of uh, it, it still contains some sodium chloride. So our objective is to reduce or to eliminate totally this percent of sodium chloride, and uh, of, of course to reduce also the compound the content of polyphenol in waste waters to protect the environment. And uh, another problem is uh, the period, the fermentation period, which is too long, eh? too long here in, uh, in traditional process. It is a spontaneous fermentation process, which may take takes uh, four to six months, and it is not well controlled, because so it can leave, it can, uh, it can uh, conduct or to produce uh, spoilages, various spoilages in olives and the food losses consequently. So that's why we, uh, as I said, we chose to work, to work on biological debattering to select ferment, lactic acid bacteria, for, and yes, autochthonous microorganism, which can assure the elimination of bitterness, biological debattering, and also to, uh, to, 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 you, to be used as a preservative. Uh, instead of chemicals uh, in order to avoid chemicals in, in this process. And also for their positive attribute like richness in nutrient, antioxidant and antimicrobials, which can be benefit for, in, uh, in antistinal, uh, for, for the consumer. So we started uh, by isolation of microorganisms from traditional company, tra tra yes, a, tra a small company we're producing traditional olives uh, located here in Wujda. Next time when we come to Wujda, we will visit it to see that, uh, the Arda weed. It's very interesting to see. And, uh, and all these, uh, the, the samples we, we obtained, we isolated the lactic acid bacteria and yeast to be used in their uh, in production of uh, starters. Yes, some works are published, uh, maybe if you can see, uh, many works are published because there are many, many variants of this process and many varieties. Here we work only with the Moroccan Pecholin variety, which is uh, the most dominant, uh, the main uh, variety which is uh, dominating in Moroccan uh, area, 
in Morocco, but there are other, other varieties which are at the introduced uh, international varieties like manzanilla, like escolana, like. But the main one is Moroccan pichulin green olive uh, variety. So when we study the process, we see that uh, the the the, the, chem, the microbiological aspect of pro the traditional process, it seems like the other one, the the, the modern one. But uh, there are very important parameters to, to, to study, uh, particularly at the beginning, in the beginning of the process, which is uh, crucial to control, to, 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 to supervise, to avoid spoilers, to avoid foodborne diseases. Many aspects are, uh, should be controlled at this moment, in the beginning of fermentation. Uh, but uh, when, if, the, if the process is succeeded, uh, we can uh, directly obtain the, the second phase and the third phase, which is very interesting. Here, the third phase. And at the, in this phase, like this, we, we is the best moment to isolate uh, microorganisms for uh, selection of starters. Not here in the beginning, because uh, there are other parameters to control here. So for biological debattery, the chemical process is uh, the main molecule, the main uh, molecule which is uh, found or naturally occurring in olives is olopropine. And this olopropine is a glycoside. It means a, a polyphenol uh, linked with the beta 1, 4 link uh, with glucose. So when we use a chemical, uh, it means sodium hydroxide, there is a direct degradation of uh, this link, the, the beta acid, and this one to release hydroxytyrosol and ilonic acid and glucose, which will be fermented by, uh, by microorganism. But during in, in modern process, when we use ke chemicals, the sodium hydroxide, there are three washing which are uh, uh, operated to eliminate the exit of, uh, of sodium hydroxide. So during washing, we lose a lot of uh, glucose, which is interesting, uh, important for bacteria, and also nutrients like uh, uh, prebiotics and probiotics, like uh, ileonolic acid, hydroxytorozo, which is interesting for human health. All these compounds are lost during the debitrin and washing of olives uh, in modern process. That, this is a negative point in this uh, industrial process, which are uh, to be, should be, which means uh, replaced or uh, used in another way. But, but when we look in this, uh, on this process, biologically, this process can be, this reaction can be achieved by microorganisms, particularly using enzymes, beta glucosidase which degrade, which release only glucose, uh, which can be fermented by lactic microorganism. And also this aglycone can be degraded by esterase, another enzyme, enzyme uh, which release the hydroxytorozol, as you know, which is important. The hydroxytorozol is interesting as an antioxidant for, my, for a human being, for, for consumer. That's why we, when we look at this, this reaction, this biochemical reaction, we, see, we said, okay, here I, we have to try or to check if you can find lactic acid bacteria, which can realize this, uh, this reaction. First for debitrin elimination of, because uh, there is one important uh, information to say is the, deb the bitter test is mainly, mainly found here in this, in this link beta 1, 4, yeah, because this, the, the bitter test is found in many compounds, particularly vegetable compounds from plants. And we look, when we look inside the molecules which are uh, involved uh, occurring in this plant, we find mainly this kind of link, so beta 1, 4. That's why uh, we think if we degrade this link, we can reduce the, 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 the bitter test and uh, consequently the bitter olives. That's why we checked that the strain we isolated were tested for their capacity of degradation of, of uh, olopine, 
of this polyphenol. Here, uh, lactobacillus, and here, a yeast. Here, uh, the enzyme, the commercial enzyme, here in the water. So, okay, we selected, of course, we selected some lactic acid bacteria with, with the beta glucosidase activity. It means capable of degrading to degrade uh, olopein into hydroxyterosol and other compounds. And this, this work was published in previous works. And we followed this biodegradation during culture, during one week of culture. And you can see here, you can see at the beginning, in the beginning, there is a small content of hydroxytorozole and the high content of olopein. But during uh, the fermentation at the end, you can see that the content of hydroxytorozole increased while the olopein decreased because you have to read this. 350, here's 700, here's 1,100. Meaning that uh, the strain, we have uh, selected one strain which was able to degrade uh, olopein into hydroxytorozole. And this was confirmed by thin layer chromatography. Uh, the, pro the degradation the degradation of olopein into hydroxytyrosol. And maybe there are other here, there are other compounds that we could not identify uh, in the past. I don't know, uh, we have to, to conduct another work here to, uh, to identify this compound. So the beta glucosidase enzyme of lactobacillus and candida, uh, yes, we isolated also from, uh, which are auto autochthonous, this, this microorganism. The, this enzyme is induced. It means the substrate should be present in order to, uh, to, to stimulate the production of the enzyme by microorganism, which is, which is interesting. Also, it is extracellular. It means it is produced outside, uh, facilitating its extraction of, uh, in the future to be used as a, a pure enzyme, enzyme for uh, in, in biodegradation process of molecular weight. 600 kilo, kilo Dalton. It, the, its production is inhibited by sodium chloride. This is very interesting results because what we, we can see here that uh, sodium chloride is bad not only for people, for, consume, for the consumer, but also for lactic acid bacteria. And yes, to produce it, inhib also it inhibits the production of the enzyme, which is a very interesting result we found. However, it was stimulated, the activity of beta glucosidase is stimulated by sodium chloride and other cations like magnesium, manganese, uh, uh, bivalent, bivalent cations. Yeah, so this work, yes, also is what was uh, published in recent work. In addition, in addition to uh, Biological debatering, we studied probiotic properties of lactic acid bacteria, uh, particularly their capacity of their antimicrobial activity. And we found that uh, microorganism uh, or microflora, or lact particularly lactic acid bacteria and yeast isolated from this environment demonstrated important antimicrobial activity because they are naturally selected in this extreme environment, which is rich of sodium, sodium chloride, uh, polyphenols, and competitive microorganisms. That's why when we found at the end of the fermentation process, when we find microorganisms with important activities, it means that we are, they are naturally selected to be dominant, to dominate in this, uh, I can say, this extreme environment. That's why we found here with antifungal activity important antifungal activity uh, and also antibacterial. Here, no activity at PH4, uh, PH7 neutrality. It, means, uh, it is due all, all, only to organic acids, but against listeria, which is gram-positive, like, like lactobacillus, which is gram-positive, the activity is not lost at PH7. Uh, but important result here is the activity against yeast, this, this result open, open us uh, the field of uh, uh, application of this lactic acid bacteria in uh, foods, in, uh, to be used as antifungals in foods and uh, in medicine, I guess pathogen and I guess uh, foods, 
uh, yeah, means uh, Fengi involved in, uh, in food spoilage. And they are also, they showed important uh, enzymatic properties, but only lipase was not detected. Uh, uh, but beta glucose is important, but uh, lipase is not detected, meaning that it's good for, for preservation of olives, which are rich of, of lipid, means olive oil. Here, uh, this, this yes, these lactic acid bacteria were tested uh, in preservation uh, in other foods like tomato puree and uh, uh, pears and uh, juices, and it shows it showed important results in preserving uh, many foods uh, against fungi. Yeah. So these selected microorganisms, lactic acid bacteria, Lactobacillus, and Candida pelliculosa particular cell free supernatant. I indicated here cell free supernatant because the, the, role, the role of yeasts in ferment in early fermentation is not yet well understood. Uh, there, are, there is still a controversy between uh, researchers in this uh, on the importance and the, the role, the role of uh, yeasts in this process. Some people say that it's very good, it's are good for uh, stimulate the growth of lactic acid bacteria, yes, but they are associated with, with the uh, olive spoilage and also with the reduction of uh, acidity in olives. Okay, that's why we use it only cell-free supernatant. Uh, we mix it uh, with the freeze-dried lactic acid bacteria and tested it on olives. Here you can see olives with no sodium hydroxide. Here, olives with sodium hydroxide. You can see here the difference in color. So it uh, it's, uh, appears that uh, a good result is obtained here in terms of color, of uh, olive color. Uh, and uh, after that, the, the, the fermentation process obtained, uh, it means the fermentation is ended only on 40 days, on 40 days in, because here the fermentation is incubated at, at, 30, at 30 degree now in incubator, not uh, in the environment, in open, in open air, in open air. But uh, here in olives, the olives uh, inoculated and treated with sodium hydroxide, there is a, a, a delay, a delay in the, fer in the fermentation process development. And also, with the in presence of starter, the, the gas pocket. I don't know if you know the gas pocket spoilage. And the gas pocket spoilage is a, a spoilage is a, caused by all gas heterofermentative microorganisms which are producing gases, gas from their metabolism, which which enter in the in the in the flesh or in the olive flesh. And after that, the, the flesh becomes uh, bound or uh, uh, full of gases. So, but here in control, we can see that 30%, the incidence is about 34%. Here is the olive we fermented. Uh, here is the image of the olive we fermented, the results. You can see it is good in color uh, compared to the to the olive treated with sodium hydroxide uh, because lactic acid, lactobacillus plantarum, we, we use it, the, the developed, uh, for produces a good um, um, quantity of lactic acid and particularly changed the color from green to yellow. However, there is still a, regis, a residual bitterness. Yes, we are not uh, uh, able to eliminate the total bitterness of the olives. Uh, I don't know. We are working on that to, to reduce the, this, this, uh, this problem. But when we observe the content of hydroxyterosol in olives, we see that the increase of, uh, in olives treated with lactobacillus plantarum are highly uh, enriched with, with the hydroxyterosol uh, from 11 to 144 or from 10 to 160, it means that there is an, a high increase uh, enrichment of, uh, of olive fruits 
in hydroxytyrosol, which is uh, important antioxidant, which is stable uh, for uh, in olives, in fermented olives. And uh, when we compare it with the with the uh, with other olives, when well, it means a pictogram of tentative evaluation of uh, organogalactic properties. Here we find that there is a, yes, still, uh, the olives are still bitter, of course, but lower than the control and higher than the control. Uh, it means the, the, the industrial, the modern process from the red, the red line is of the modern process. Here the control not inoculated and here the, the, the green and the blue lines are the, the olives uh, inoculated by uh, with the lactobacillus plantarum isolated. Uh, this, uh, the process was patented here. I don't know if you can see uh, the patent. Yes, it was patented. And uh, here the olives are, the olive produced from this process. It's our, uh, our photo, it means. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, the, pro pro the development is, is not yet uh, commercially developed. And uh, here I should, uh, I should thank um, all my, my team my, uh, who, are con who contributed to this work. Uh, uh, some of them were students and they, they become now professors. Like Nabil, Yahya, Hussam, and we have another uh, PhD student uh, who we are still waiting, and others. He, uh, for example, here Ismail, a student. He is a student working on lipolysis, lipase from lactic acid bacteria. Uh, we found a small quantity of, of lipase in lactic acid bacteria isolated from this uh, from these uh, olives. Uh, we don't know why, but uh, it's small. And other students here are working. Uh, we included other properties like uh, sonification in olives. We have a paper which is which will appear next to June on this on this work. Uh, we combined sonification with uh, inoculation and uh, and. Uh, Another carbon, you know, another carbon source to, to reduce the bitterness of uh, the olive to solve the problem of bitterness. Uh, okay, here uh, are the institution who involved or are involved who helped us in this work. We work uh, collaborators, Senareste uh, from Morocco, my university, the ISPA from Italy, Milan. McGill University from Canada where, and uh, our company, uh, our friend with whom we work, it's a very good uh, person. I would like to thank him very, very much because uh, they, they helped us in sampling, uh, provide us samples and olives to, for, uh, for other works or for uh, three years for fermentation olives. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Abdeslam, for your presentation. Um, let's see if there are any questions. For those of you who may have come in later in this webinar, we decided to make a slight change in the, the agenda. We uh, are having the presentations right, uh, the questions, sorry, right after each presentation. Uh, and not as a final discussion because uh, Carola from FAO had to leave after her presentation. So I ask you now either uh, to raise your hand or put your questions in the chat regarding the presentation of Abdeslam. But actually I, I have a question for you Abdeslam and uh, starting at the end, first a comment. Uh, I would like to uh, highlight the importance of working with companies. We have also worked a lot with companies. Yes. And this, uh, this might also have a, a role. We may also play a role in contributing to how they can reduce their um, waste and recycle it. Uh, also, this exchange of uh, knowledge can be very important. But my question 
to you is, is uh, specific. You talked about the benefit of starters uh, for decreasing or for controlling the, the bitterness. But what about the benefit of starters uh, in all for the fermentation of uh, table olives to towards the environmental protection, which you had in your title and you started by that? How can the use of starters contribute to this? Yes. Uh, when uh, we analyzed only one parameter, the others are still in progress because it's too difficult for us to find. Uh, uh, for example, the, the nutritional analysis of the product is not is in progress, but we analyzed only the the hydroxytosol, the polyphenol. So uh, during the fermentation process, there is an increase, an increase in hydroxytosol, hydroxytosol, which is an, an important antioxidant, uh, which is uh, highly desired in food, in foods for uh, for health. And also there is a decrease in uh, olopein, which, which can be degraded and uh, it, is, uh, it has a bitterness, uh, bitter tastes in olives. That's why people can't, can't eat directly uh, olives, raw fruits or leaves. Uh, for instance, leaves have very antimicrobial activity because of this, guy, this molecule, the, the olopein, which has uh, important antimicrobial activity. But the increase of hydroxytosol is interesting in terms of it increased the nutraceutical, the antioxidant property of the fruit, of the edible product. Uh, the other aspects like uh, uh, content, it means the content of uh, amino acid or uh, sugars or other nutrient is in progress. We didn't, uh, we did not yet finish it. That's why what I said that we are not yet in the, in the development or the, of the, a new company for on this, on this uh, patent. Okay, thank you. And uh, we have another question here in the chat for you. Our colleague Miguel Elias is asking, asking you if you could please inform about the concentration that you use the starters of both lactic acid bacteria and yeasts. Yeah. Normally we started, we started the fermentation with uh, 10 exposant five, five log, with five log uh, safe U, uh, one milliliter. It's, if we have a liquid, a liquid we use 1%, 1% because it is fry dried and it is of, uh, about uh, 10 to 12 log CFU per gram. Uh, the, the powder you see, you saw uh, on the slide, it's the powder of, lactic, of lactobacillus. We, we leophilized powder, uh, like a culture, in which we had uh, 10 to 12, 12 log CFU per gram. And this it was diluted to obtain, to, to initiate the fermentation with five log. Uh, we start the fermentation to assure a, a good, uh, a good uh, it means a good speed initiate the fermentation with the high speed. To avoid the initial phase. You remember the first uh, slide when, when, the, when uh, I showed third phases, phase one, phase two, and phase three. It's important to start with the phase two, not the phase one. That's why we have to increase the concentration of lactic acid bacteria in the medium to avoid the antibacteria, which can come from, uh, from the environment, from olives and, uh, and water. Because it's too difficult at the industrial scale to work in pure culture fermentation. It means in aseptic condition. That's why we have to increase the, the starter to, to dominate, to allow the domination of the starter over the other microorganisms. Okay, thank you. Uh, Miguel, are you happy or do you want to <laughs> ask you uh, any question? further question to yes, others? Yes, of course. Welcome. Welcome, Miguel. Or any other colleague? Do you have any further questions? I, I have another question. Yes. How do you eat the olive uh, leaves, please, in powder or? 
It's very in interesting. How? Oh? We eat. Uh, yes, you, you show, um, you show... Uh, olives. Uh, uh, olive uh, leaves. And uh, how do you eat? Uh, ah, that, uh, yes. In whole, uh, uh, whole, whole, whole leaf, uh, in powder. Uh, how, how do you eat? Yes. The olive leaves here are considered as a byproduct. Nobody eats, uh, they use it only when you have candidas, for example, uh, because it has an antimicrobial activity. It is rich of, uh, of olopein, of polyphenol, particularly olopein. When we, we, when we check in uh, databases, in bibliographic databases, we find that olopein during 60 and 70, the, it was considered as antimicrobial, as antibiotic uh, compound. But in the traditional process, there is a natural selection of lactic acid bacteria and other microorganisms who are able to degrade this, this, uh, this kind of compound. But it has an anti antibiotic activity. We can use it as uh, anti candidose against candida, against uh, mm. uh, infection, uh, yes, in our mouth. It's an antibiotic. Of but course, it is now a byproduct. You Nobody uses it. You don't eat the leaves. You don't eat the olive leaves. You just use no. them to extract some uh, compounds. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any the, further questions? The the first uh, uh, the first step we use it to select lactic acid bacteria degrading and uh, degrading olopein uh, was their growth on olive leaf powder. We took the, the olive leaves, leaves uh, dried and powder, means grinded to obtain a powder, and you combine it in, cult in culture medium, on which we inoculate lactic acid bacteria and yeast. Uh, this allows us to select the micro strains to tolerate this uh, concentration of uh, of olopein. Yes, one percent. Okay. Yes, we thank use you. it one percent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, if there are no further questions from the audience, I thank you again, Abdeslam, for uh, for being uh, here. And we move on with our agenda to our uh, last speaker, my dear colleague and friend, Ana Cristina Aguilher Santos from the University of Évora. Uh, and she will uh, speak to us about reduction of food losses and waste in the agro-food sector, some sustainable solutions. Maybe, Cristina, you can provide it with some answers to why Portugal does not... Uh, for, uh, give any data to FAO and why they have so uh, few data from Mediterranean countries. Maybe you have some solutions here. Uh, Christina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for being here with us today. Hello, Marta. Thank you for your kind words. Uh, I, I want to ask you if you are seeing the PowerPoint. Yes? yes. Okay. Well, first of all, I have to say that I'm, I feel a little bit ashamed because uh, the, my colleagues, uh, speakers, they were really fantastic. With uh, very updated uh, uh, information about uh, food loss and waste. And uh, now my, my colleague from Morocco is with a, a very interesting and deep uh, information about, um, about uh, olives olives and a new, a new process of olives. Okay, but um, my, my goal is to, was and is to, to, to think with you about this problem of food loss and waste. Uh, first of all, it's, uh, it's a, a very, um, it's normal to speak about this uh, nowadays. Uh, everybody uh, speaks about this. Everybody uh, knows a lot about this, like myself, that I, I'm more only curious about, uh, about this issue. But uh, um, this is a very uh, 
a, a very serious problem that we have nowadays. Uh, and um, the, one of the big problems is the data. Is uh, beginning with the concept. Is the concept. It's the, the the word that you should use to refer each part of the food losses and waste. Why is this so important? Because the the definition uh, takes uh, takes us to different points of the to different points of the food supply chain. So when we speak about food losses and and um, um, and waste, you can think about. Uh, the fruits that remain in the field or uh, to the fruit that we buy in the supermarket and you let it be at home and you don't eat it because it becomes too, too, too ripe. Uh, so it's completely different. Uh, the, the process in, is completely different. The attitude uh, that we have to add to avoid this kind of food waste and loss. So when we speak about food, food um, uh, waste and food loss, we are referring different parts of the uh, chain, okay? Food loss and waste, uh, they refer always to the decrease in quantity or also quality. I'm going to speak about this later of quality of food along the food supply chain, okay? Food, life, food loss um, uh, refers to the first part of the chain, to the production, to the distribution, to the work that is done in the, in the central to, to put uh, different calibers. All of this, the post harvest issue, it, it uh, drops in the food loss, okay? Food waste, it, it refers to uh, the consumer, the, the consumer and the retail. It's quite different and the approaches are quite different and uh, all of us, we have to think how to do, how to avoid these enormous numbers of uh, food loss and waste. This is dynamic, the world is dynamic. We change with time and people change with time and society change also. And uh, we have something, uh, this issue is also very dynamic. And uh, one fact that uh, Michael, uh, that uh, Carola referred uh, in the first moment, it's very important. We don't have numbers enough to think deeply about this problem, okay? Uh, worldwide, there are countries with uh, very um, satisfactory uh, work in, in uh, studying numbers, quantities of food loss and waste. And there are others like us, like Portugal, that we don't have any kind of numbers uh, that we send to, we should send to, uh, to the to, to FAO, to FAO, and we don't do that. We have a very old report. We have a very interesting work done by, by uh, Professor Eva Pires uh, in Perda, but uh, 10 years ago, and things change. And, uh, and nowadays there are a new report uh, that tell us that things are not static and things are not uh, the problem is not as we suppose it was. Uh, one example is that uh, um, it was uh, assumed that uh, the, in, the very, in developed countries, in Europe, United States, Canada, this group, uh, the losses, uh, the, the food loss and waste, and waste always occur in the consume consumer level and not in production level and nowadays this new report tell us that it is not like that in many european countries there are a lot of uh, losses during the first part of the supply chain not the transportation it's very accurate it's true but during the harvest during the uh, all the, the those uh, production works, uh, you know, and this is very important because governments 
should know these numbers in order to look uh, to the problem and to act according to the problem. Okay, so this is my reflection. Why don't we have really numbers to sell to FAO to make the proper uh, work with that? I'm very happy with that, uh, that uh, talk of Carola because maybe it's a beginning of, uh, of um, more knowledge about, about that. Um, nowadays, I'm going to pass this uh, fast because I think that uh, it was uh, a talk to, and uh, you know this, this kind of, uh, of uh, numbers. But uh, nowadays we have uh, the, the numbers, um, estimated and the estimation is a very, uh, it's not very certain, it's not very clear sometimes. And uh, this, uh, this um, figure that, that I have here, uh, it is from a very good work from Caldera. Uh, it's very recent and you can check that fruits and vegetables are always the worst. Uh, are, are always to the, those uh, um, sectors where the food loss and waste are um, stronger. Uh, but look please at these, these bars here and you can notice they are very, very big. And they refer, this is the error, and they refer the minimum and the maximum values of the food waste calculated for each group. And you can notice that they are really uh, big because uh, this is a very, uh, as I told, very di dynamic, but also very in certain sectors. And fruits and vegetables, as all of us know, are uh, very, very subject to decay, to overripe, uh, and so on. Uh, so um, there are. Uh, some lines that we can think how to, how to decrease the numbers of food loss and, and chain and food loss and, um, and waste in these uh, several different steps. Okay, uh, I, I decided to present you uh, some practical uh, cases that I think that are uh, very uh, interesting to see as step by step, uh, we can do an effort to um, decrease this uh, level, okay? Um, to, to, to go on with the idea of measuring of have numbers, first of all, to know where, where does it happen? In, in what part of the chain, okay? And other, the other step should be how, how much do we lose? How much uh, quantity, how much quality uh, it's, uh, it's uh, occurring in that step of the, the chain? And so there are two kinds of, uh, there are several approaches, but there are two kinds of uh, practical approaches. One is to use the food loss index from FAO that is published. It's very clear to use. It has a lot of examples. It's free in the net and you can check it and try to do it, including it in your research projects. It doesn't matter. It's necessary to have numbers. And the other one is by another, another, how can I say, another, um, not enterprise, another organization, uh, United Nations Environmental Program, and uh, uh, it, they, they tell us how to measure the food waste index for the last part of the chain, okay? So it's important to have a systematic way of doing this, and these two, are published. You, you can use it, use it, you can study it and uh, uh, generate like this uh, uh, good information. So I think that uh, it is urgent. It is urgent to, uh, to give information 
for on food waste levels uh, based in common methodology. That's why I was uh, referring those two. And this is an obligation of the member states since uh, four years ago. Uh, so I, I can't understand why we don't have this, the, our part of this work uh, done. And um, it's also an obligation of governments to give, uh, uh, to afford the research uh, in this area, because it's really necessary to decrease these numbers. That's, uh, we have a very small part of the investments in the research in food loss and waste. And I think this should change uh, in uh, a very nearby uh, time. Uh, and uh, we also have to think that it is necessary to design again our food systems. And uh, maybe uh, the food supply chain, the short supply chains are one of the answers to this case. So um, after these thoughts, I I'd like to present you some uh, case studies in Portuguese, casos estudo. I forgot to translate this. Uh, and uh, I have some practical uh, cases. Uh, the one is about, uh, uh, it's a, a, a small enterprise here in the south of Portugal. Uh, and uh, what do they do? They use uh, the papers that are not, uh, um, that are byproducts because they are not used as fresh uh, papers to uh, to process them and to make new products. It's very curious because they don't do uh, a traditional product only, but they try different recipes uh, to, to have uh, different flavors and to, to, to increase the consume of that kind of, of products. And they, they told me that they, they have a lot of success with this uh, kind of products. And uh, uh, the other one, it's another enterprise here from the region also, then that uh, uh, use the peers, the apples uh, out of caliber to make, uh, to make, uh, I, I don't know, to make uh, um, it about purest. I don't know the name, a purest to, to, to eat like a, a gourmet uh, sweet or dessert and uh, they, they, use, uh, they use it for a long time and they uh, remain doing this because they sell them. Uh, to prevent the, 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 the losses, I, I would like to, to, to show you a work that we, we did here in the university with uh, during a master uh, work with someone from Cabo Verde, and uh, we did a very interesting work. Or I, I, I think so, um, because the Elsa Simões, the, the owner of this work, she was able to to transmit this to people in Cabo Verde, people that uh, are really working with papaya there. And what, what, what did uh, Elsa did here uh, in the university? She, she studied the papaya. Papaya is a climateric fruit. So uh, it has a very specific um, um, behavior of, uh, of respiration and the ripeness. And she noticed that people harvest them in different ripeness stage, uh, the, the yellow one, the green one, and they put them together with the bananas, for example. And, and what, what, what is here the problem? What is here the problem in this photo? It's that the ripe fruits are, are producing ethylene that are going to increase the ripeness of the other fruits, of the green stage fruit. And bananas, they are a big boosters of ethylene. So they are also ripening these fruits. So uh, this kind of mixture is the best one to, to uh, not to preserve the fruits, not to, to have a long shelf life. The shelf life here, it's by sure 
uh, uh, short, short shelf life, okay? The, another problem, it's here because the transportation, it's difficult to pay and people, what do they do? They, they, they put this kind of papers of cartoons, uh, on cartoon of paper, uh, art paper to, to transport more papayas. And so they suffer a lot of uh, uh, physical damages. Uh, what do we propose? These kind of boxes, the price is not higher and they, they allow to, to put several boxes without damage the papayas and to choose the papayas for the same group. Uh, another, another idea is not to harvest papayas to, 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 to green, because like this, they are not able to properly uh, uh, ripe and they are not good papayas uh, for, for eating. So this is the, the other approach. You can tell or think, but what is this? This is not a way of, uh, of decreasing uh, food loss and waste. No, it is, it is because we are, uh, we are um, preventing the loss of, uh, of papayas in the field, during the transportation and in the retail, uh, when, when uh, uh, consumers are buying it in Rabidantish, in the people that sell them in the market, okay? Another important uh, uh, prevention of nutritional quality. Uh, what is the, the, the problem? Sometimes uh, it's, it's very usual. Producers uh, harvest uh, the fruits uh, too green and ripe fruits. And the, the question is that, uh, uh, are they doing a good work for nutritional goal? No, because, uh, because fruits need to ripe to develop the, the really nutritional value they have. Uh, we, are, we have an example, a work done in, here in the, our university too, uh, that we can found that uh, cherries, now it's cherry time, uh, cherries in the first two stages, this one and this one, the first two, uh, as a value of antioxidant much more lower than that, that one that is ripe uh, in the tree. Uh, so another, another way of preventing nutritional losses to indicate to have numbers, to have information to give to farmers about the ideal ripeness stage to harvest fruits, okay? How can you do that? You can do that nowadays using um, material or equipment like uh, NIR. Um, NIR uh, measures the, the, how can I say? Uh, as you, if you look here to, to, to your right side, you can see that NIR has uh, a very short uh, wavelength. Uh, and uh, this, this method is nowadays very practical. It, you can do that very quickly. You can do that uh, uh, without depending off uh, of the, the people that use it. Uh, it's very easy to, to do, the, to obtain uh, those, uh, those, uh, those spectra that you see here. The, the problem, not the problem, the work that has to be done is to, to compare this uh, obtain correlations uh, between uh, using uh, statistical methods with the normal, uh, the usual uh, chemical and physical uh, evaluation that, uh, that are done to fruits. And after that, to, to, to understand and to, cert to, have, to, to be sure uh, what this measure. Uh, an example of a recent work done with uh, strawberries, uh, the near the NRI uh, measure very easily the um, total soluble solids, the the, sh the sugar content, not exactly the the sugar content, but uh, a very useful measure of sugar content in in post harvest. Okay, so it is a non-destructive, fast. Uh, easy to use method to evaluate 
quality and ripeness stage. There are a lot of uh, equipments that you can use in the field, in the orchard, or in, in the, the, the shop, in retail. It depends whatever you want to do. So it's a very, a very uh, up-to-date uh, um, form of, of uh, prevent uh, nutritional uh, loss. Another, another example that uh, it's uh, an old one, uh, it's not very known, I'm not sure, uh, but it is an enterprise called Frubasa that several years ago, several decades ago, began to use the fruits that are um, out of caliber to uh, make juices. And uh, they, they give a, a, a big step for the enterprise at that time uh, because they have a lot of problem, uh, a, a, a huge problem with, uh, with apples out of caliber and they were able to valorize them. They, they have now a very known uh, uh, juice fruit with a very good, good uh, sensory evaluation. Uh, and they tried an, not uh, an innovative method to, con to preserve the, the, the juice uh, using uh, high pressure. Uh, and so they produce uh, high, uh, natural uh, juice fruit with high pressure, without residues, uh, they don't have a very long uh, shelf life, but they are really uh, very good in nutritional and sensorial uh, evaluation. It is uh, also uh, a way of reducing uh, that, uh, that kind of, um, of waste. Another approach is to look to the sub to supply chains. Uh, I have here. I have had the year, but I I I am no, not anymore with this in my PowerPoint. Uh, a very complicated approach about supply chains in the produce in in food products. It's very complicated, and it has a lot of steps and uh, uh, gaps and so on. So people know that if the supply chain is shorter, the, uh, the FLO, uh, the, 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 sorry, the food loss and waste decrease. And uh, one of the ways of doing that is valorizing, add value to the regional uh, produce, uh, food products. Here in the university, we, we, we take profit of an idea from slow food, that is called uh, uh, zero kilometer, kilometer, kilometer zero, as, as you say it. Uh, and it, it is not new. Uh, there are uh, a lot of experience in uh, Italy, in the United States and so on. But uh, we tried it here. Uh, and what is our idea? Is to increase the, 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 the food products that are produced and consumed in the region. Uh, of course, some of them go out of the region, but it's necessary to, uh, to uh, pick some out of that region. We established uh, 50 kilometers after uh, a long work of uh, uh, knowing the region and the producers, and uh, uh, we decided uh, to think about 50 kilometers. Uh, and, uh, we certificate the, the, the kilometers air produce uh, products. And also uh, in the year we have restaurants, groceries, uh, producers, in order to have all the supply chain with this, this kind of guarantee. It's difficult, but I think this is an opportunity to valorize the gastronomy of the region, the tour, the gastronomy, the, the, the tourism in the in the region also, and to give to the producers some some sensation of uh, uh, be easy to sell the product. It's one of the problems that uh, we have here in the in the region. Um, another project, another project that I hope uh, that. Uh, 
um, in a, a future is able to, to give uh, some more information about food loss and waste is the, this project where uh, that university is participating is for agro and uh, we want to identify and characterize waste generation points in agrofood industries. This project is only about agrofood industries, not consumers. But uh, we want also to present some innovative solutions. Sometimes a solution is not a big issue or is not uh, very, um, it, 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 it can have not a, a very strong impact, but if we have one small and another small impact, uh, all together are able to make the difference. Uh, and uh, with, a, with a view to improving production, uh, we are able also to reduce environmental uh, impacts. What do I, do I think that we have to do? We have to re rethink about uh, food loss and waste. Uh, we have to know where it happens. It's, it's an important and a basic uh, support for all, all of this. To know the reality of each link in the supply chain and to know, to, 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 to be sure that is about that sector, about that product. Not, we cannot generalize it because we make a lot of mistakes with that. And we have to be realistic and objective to turn food waste in a food resource. Uh, in the end, I like to, to tell that uh, governments and companies together, uh, they are able to do something and they are, they are uh, I will, uh, uh, we all together, but uh, with government, with not, not only to have the name in the commission, but to do, to do really uh, uh, work in the, in the fields. Uh, we are able together to improve food security, to protect the environment and to give uh, to all of us a, a better world. And that's all. Thank you very much, Christina, for this very interesting presentation. It's a pity that Carola wasn't able to stay until the very end. I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, maybe she is not aware of some um, of this data that you just presented here regarding specific cases here in Portugal. And uh, while uh, our colleagues think about questions to ask you, I also wanted to share that I think uh, most of us here, if not all of us here uh, present today, we all come from different Mediterranean countries, either um, North European, uh, either from North Mediterranean or South Mediterranean countries. And we should seize the occasion that we had the chance to meet Carola here and she said that we could send the information directly to her. We have the responsibility as researchers also to share the knowledge that we gather in our uh, research projects within the dissertations and theses of our students, some of these data are not uh, available in a way that FAO can use them to include them in the databases. I'm not even sure, you mentioned before, Cristina, the, the PERDA project. I'm not even sure if the results of the PERDA project were ever included in the FAO database. Of course, now they are old data. They are very but still, old. <laughs> but still, they probably were never included in the first place. So I think we should really uh, seize the occasion to, and now that we have this project is as for Agro, but also uh, other colleagues that might be hearing us and other uh, have other projects probably in their home countries. It's very important to uh, get this information to FAO, whether you publish in a paper or in a dissertation or whatever. Uh, I think this is uh, really important. And I have a question for you, Christina. I don't know, not, not, not questions in the chat, but maybe you can um, ask. Uh, Car Carol, right at the very beginning, you started for me at the very basics. Of course, you are a teacher and you are used to start at the basics with the students. But one of the major problems here, besides the lack of data, 
is that the concepts are not the same for every institution. And you highlighted here and brought us very clearly the concepts of food loss and food waste. And these are the concepts used by FAO. But for example, and Carola uh, warned us about this, the EU does not use this same concept. The EU considers everything to be food loss and does not take into consideration these different steps. And here we might have already a diversity of data which are being considered wrongly as uh, food loss and maybe they are food waste. And how can we as uh, researchers, we should contribute to also to separate this. And when we give the information, try to give them using these two uh, very defined uh, mm. concepts that you uh, introduced us to of the food loss on one side and the food waste on the other side. Uh, maybe you can comment on that while we wait for other questions from the public. Well, I, I think that is very important because it's necessary to, to know uh, deeply uh, what is that kind of food or, or food loss and waste. Uh, if, you, if you don't use the same concept, you, you are going to count them in different ways. And you can uh, look at the numbers and you are... Uh, you are um, getting to, to wrong uh, conclusions, you know, because, uh, for example, uh, the, 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 um, the non-edible parts, uh, sometimes they include non-edible parts in the consumption, uh, other, other, other workers, uh, other researchers include them in, in others that are uh, other part of, of non-consumed uh, food products. And it depends of the cultural aspects. We you don't eat some parts of the chicken and other, uh, in other countries they consume it. Uh, so uh, this should be deeply, but deeply uh, studied and defined, okay? And uh, uh, this is, I think this is the first step. But if you are going to do a, a, a very well done and well think work, uh, to, to count, to weight, to measure it, uh, you should use one of the protocols of FA, FAO of, or another institution, and that is always referred. Okay, it is always very well explained what do you should do. You should consider in in, in each part of the sector. Uh, so. Uh, to think and to look for information because uh, before uh, beginning with the practical work, I think it's it's always important, but here it's really, really very, very important to define uh, what are you going to, to count and to, to, to define it in your report. Okay. Thank you, Christina. We have a question here from our colleague Elsa in the chat. From the data that you have available and what you know of in the case of Portugal, even if there are only a few data available, do you think that Portugal is a country with high food loss and food waste? Is this a big problem in our country? And do you suspect if this is worse at the level of food loss or food waste? Uh, there, there are uh, um, new data from uh, the last year and then they tell us that in Europe, uh, the, 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 the consumers are the worst consumers <laughs> of all. And uh, it's almost the double of the number that people are uh, used to, to worry about. The, 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 the act of consumers is really bad. And uh, when uh, we estimate it, it is uh, lower than in, it is in the reality. And uh, the, the, the numbers tell it very clearly, but the numbers are uh, published uh, one or two months ago and they are not very known uh, until now. Uh, so in Europe and Portugal, you are really bad in consumption. Uh, we, we waste a lot, a lot, a lot. And um, another, another important uh, idea is that uh, in 
near consumption is not easy, but it's, uh, it's it, it, consumers can be rich by a, a lot of, uh, of um, opportunities. And they can have, there are a lot of programs uh, that uh, are increasing uh, happily, like refood, like others that take profit of foods in the last part of the, of the consumption. And uh, the experience of other countries, like uh, United Kingdom, like Netherlands, they were able to reduce a lot the consumer in five, six years with the programs in TV, in internet, in radio, with campaigns, uh, social approach to the, to the problem. And they really have very good results. So I think that uh, we are able, we in Mediterranean area, we are able to do the same. But I believe that uh, we are really bad in consumption. <laughs> I think so. Can I? Yes. I was thinking that it, it is a pity that um, no previous data exists for Portugal, or at least not very detailed, because um, we have the sensation, I, I, only a sensation and can be not true, that uh, now uh, we are more aware of, um, of waste and uh, uh, for example, in restaurants, is more normal to have people uh, taking what is um, remaining in the in the plates and take home to not go to the, to avoid to go to the garbage. But uh, we cannot know if we are improving or not since we don't have that um, from previous well, years. We but, we did not have the culture of taking leftovers from restaurants home, so I think. We must be improving because we were at such a, a low level. Uh, we must be improving. But, but I think we are improving because I, I see some people that yes. are more aware of doing this in restaurants and uh, the owners of the restaurants advising to do also. So I think it can be improving. And it is awful what I'm going to say, but <laughs> the pandemic situation, uh, it, it was a... Uh, uh, generate that kind of use because uh, the takeaway, uh, but but there is another problem, the package. <laughs> yes, yes. yes. <laughs> another problem. Okay, but uh, nowadays we are able to do that uh, easily without a shame. And uh, I think that is uh, really a good step uh, to decrease the, the food loss and waste. Uh, but I, I I have to say that I, it's 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 a, a gap a lack whatever we want to, to, to claim uh, because we don't have any kind of data in FAO and we are obliged to do that and uh, we have a, a commission uh, published in our Diario da República and we have people working on that and uh, if you read the reports you see that uh, as I is the only one that make any kind of work, but including in, in their own goal, they are not there uh, to, to do the work of the others. So yeah. I, I think that we all, <laughs> we all have to claim about that and to, and to say we have, we want uh, to have data, we want to have conditions, uh, um, research programs, it doesn't matter what, look at other countries, and uh, look how they do, how, do, how they have been doing that uh, during during uh, the last years, and some of them with very good results. I think we should uh, think and uh, claim. <laughs> we have we have uh, two further questions here in the chat. Actually, one question and one comment. Uh, the comment is uh, from uh, Ali. And Ali, uh, you, I fully agree with what he's saying. I think that what's considered waste in some countries is considered as raw material for other industries in other countries. So the speaking about food waste may have different meanings in the Mediterranean countries. Of yeah. course, it's not waste if you're going to use it. I think he meant this as a, a comment. If you're going to use it back, it's not waste. It's 
something that you can reuse in a principle of a circular economy. So waste is what you're not using anymore. It exactly. just goes waste, waste is what it's not being used, used for food, for food purposes. Okay, if you use it in another way, in another formulation, another form, uh, it, it's not uh, food, uh, food loss and waste. It's not waste. And, and the question here from Sanai, I hope I'm uh, spelling the name correctly. Uh, as we know uh, that online grocery sales are booming nowadays, could e-commerce be used as a solution to help reduce food waste? Christine, you also comment, you already commented a little bit on this. The problem is the packaging. The packaging, yes. But uh, here we have a lot of uh, small enterprises that sell in, in nearby, in the neighborhood. And there they don't have a big problem with packaging, that, that kind of, uh, of uh, enterprises, small enterprises. Uh, experts say, uh, that's not me, that... Uh, Everything that is search, search supply chain with only one person between the producer and consumer as maximum or directly or with only one, one person, that uh, this decree, this, this is a form, uh, a way of decreasing the, the, the losses. Uh, so I think the groceries, even the groceries online, can be, uh, can be uh, another step. To, 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 to decrease a little bit to the food loss and waste. In this case, the, in the last part. Yeah, so not, not just the, either being online or directly face-to-face, -face, but more the concept that you already showed us in your presentation of these short supplies uh, chains and having products, uh, fresh products uh, sold in a very near close by market then you don't have to have a package. You can bring them door to door. And we, we saw a lot of these, at least I know here in uh, Portugal, in Spain during the pandemics, maybe we can learn something from the pandemics and also yes. prof profit so something from uh, some, something that was bad, but uh, we can yeah. learn something good from that and use that for the future to help us reduce food waste at the end of the food chain. Exactly. Okay, so if there are no uh, further questions from all colleagues here, uh, I thank you all once again for being here at this webinar. I thank uh, very specially to our colleagues Anna Kristina, Abdeslam and Carola from FAO who already left. Mm -hmm. I remind you that uh, for those of you that were not at the beginning, this uh, webinar was organized by us here at the University of Evora in the framework of the AU Green Week. If you go to the webpage of uh, the European Union, uh, and you put a uh, green week, you can see a lot of events ap happening, a lot of online events, not only, but a lot of online events happening during this whole week. This is a, a whole week uh, dedicated to, uh, called the EU Green Week, dedicated to the European Green Deal. Our webinar had as thematics, the improvement of Mediterranean food systems towards food waste valorization. But the general topic of the week is EU Green Deal, make it real. And so it's also up to us researchers and scientists from these Mediterranean countries uh, to help and to contribute, to give our uh, small step further towards this um, knowledge getting to where it should and go uh, contributing to the Green Deal. So I thank you all very much once again for uh, attending this webinar and uh, see you soon.